welcome to this event. Uh, really excited to uh, host this event today, uh, which is part of a festival of events celebrating 10 years since the foundation of Sea Changes. So Sea Changes is 10 years old. And for those of you less familiar, we have a short fil uh, film to start off the event to summarize what Sea Changes has been doing over that decade. They've been giving out small grants to enable over 200 marine conservation projects, distributing over 150,000 pounds in that time. So we're now going to show the film. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I should start by introducing myself. So I'm Heather Coldaway. I'm Senior Technical Advisor at the Zoological Society of London and an honorary professor at the University of Exeter's Penryn campus uh, here in Cornwall. So this event is particularly special to me because it's about everything I care about. It's about marine conservation. It's about communities. It's about making a difference. It's about being a sea changer. And living in Cornwall, it's particularly an honor and a privilege to be hosting an event that involves such incredible local marine conservation groups making such a difference here in Cornwall. But it's not just there, this, this, the, um, what they're going to be sharing today is applicable anywhere. It's really how to drive uh, grassroots conservation efforts um, on your coast, on your piece of coast, wherever you are in the world. But none of this happens without um, some mobilization. And this, we're particularly delighted for this festival uh, to say a big thank you to Extreme Ice Cream um, for sponsoring it and making it possible. It's one of Sea Change's newest business partners and they're funding a tackling ocean plastics fund as part of Sea Change's main grant fund from this autumn. So if you've got a project in mind and you think it would benefit from this funding, then please do apply. Although this event was free as part of this festival, um, we hope that Sea Changes will be able to continue the fantastic work they've done for, last, uh, for the last decade. And so if there is any donation that you can give, uh, we'll pop a Just Giving uh, link into the chat. Um, any small donation will help. We, we can see from the presentations today that small amounts make a huge difference in what people can do. Plus there's a range of festival t-shirts and hoodies for sale. Uh, to buy via T-Mill, which is an incredible organization that's fully sustainable. And that also ranges, uh, raises money for seed changes. So what's this event going to cover today? Well, we want to spotlight the interconnected nature of grassroots marine conservation and explore why it's working so well here in Cornwall. We've got panelists from three different organizations, three groups here, the Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust, 
Newquay Marine Group and Polzeth Marine Conservation Group. So each of the uh, speakers is going to present in turn and then we're going to have a really plenty of time at the end for questions and answers and, and a good discussion. So please either put your questions in the uh, Q&A box, which is separate from the chat box at the bottom of your screens, um, and then we'll move to the discussion at the end. But let's start off with the presentations and hearing the incredible work of these groups. And first of these is Sue Sayer from Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust. This is a multi-award winning evidence-based marine conservation charity supporting a large network of active citizen scientists across the Southwest and even beyond. Routine local patch seal surveys inform a critical planning and policy nationally. Now over to Sue to tell us more about their incredible work. Thank you, Heather, for that lovely introduction. That was very kind of you. Uh, I have a very busy presentation. Uh, it's being recorded. It's intended to be a taster. Uh, so hopefully you can come back if there's something of interest. I'm going to whiz through. It's a whistle stop tour. So my name is Sue Sayer and I'm founder and director of Cornwall Silbert Research Trust. Uh, my, as I said, my slides are busy. This is a taster. Please, I'm happy for you to come back and ask for advice and help. So Cornwall Silbert Research Trust is a totally is a network of totally inspiring volunteers, paid rangers, generous funders like Sea Changers and uh, a patron, Gillian Burke. Gillian rarely supports single species charities, but she supports us as a result of our holistic approach to marine conservation. Our guiding aspiration is that of the Ecozoic era, a time of synergistic coexistence, as opposed to dominance of the environment and stewardship. We realise that us humans are just one species in a planetary ecosystem upon which we all depend. I learned this from Adam Nicholson's book, A Seabird's Cry. So if you've never heard of us, what do we do? Well, we do a lot. In 2020 alone, our volunteers completed an average of 12 surveys a day, every day of the year. We processed almost 140,000 photos to get 12,000 seal IDs. We had 94 different entangled seals and August was our worst August on record for serious disturbance. And why do we do all these surveys? Well, to give seals a voice nationally and internationally, to inform government policy and habitat management, and to solve the problems that our seals face at their time of need. So what do we do? Well, we identify individual seals from their unique fingerprint fur patterns. Left is Fairy Girl, mid is Shadow Puppet. I've known her since 2000 and she's still going strong. And right is Tulip a famous seal for adopting a pup separated from its mum in a storm. So we, so we can't actually see your presentation. So can you pop oh. on screen sharing? Thanks. Yes. OK, thank you, Heather. That's not good, is it? Best laid plans and all that. OK, can you see that now? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I actually forgot to share. Who knows? All the tense and stress of a presentation. Apologies, everybody. Anyway, back to these three seals then. Left, fairy girl. Right is shadow puppet. and uh, Right is tulip and mid is shadow puppet. Moving on. So here are some examples of individual seal life stories that we build up. Top left is Hook's calendar of IDs. Years across the top, months down the side, and it shows that when he became 10 years old, he stopped visiting his usual site to become a beach master somewhere else during the pupping season. And hopefully one day we'll find out where. In contrast, in top right, we only ever see adult female ghosts during the pupping season. She's a world record breaking seal mum, having had 17 pups in 18 years. In summary, over 20 plus years, seals in the southwest have linked to the Isle of Man, 450 kilometres away, northwest and southwest Wales, Ireland, France, Devon, Dorset, Belgium and Holland, 650 kilometres away. We need to know about this interconnectivity in order to for inform statutory protection. But more importantly, we need to win hearts and minds. When I first filmed with Chris Packham, he told me that seals didn't float his boat. 
The second time we met, he met Wild Seal Medallion Man, heard his story, and this shows the power of an interconnected human reaction to a seal because he came out of the water and he said, I love seals. It is this that motivates action in my experience. So grey seals are our equivalent of an African elephant, a globally rare species on our patch. Despite having over a third of the world's population in the UK, there are still more red squirrels in the UK than there are grey seals. They live in a treacherous environment over which they have no control. I still can't get over that. And their environment is changing, bringing numerous threats that we know from Septimus's experience, they act cumulatively. So Septimus is our adult male seal skeleton. He had a sonus, sinus and toe infection, a bent sacrum from a heavy blow, two broken vertebrae, two broken ribs, and he had been shot. Did we just get lucky to get an unlucky seal or do they all suffer like this? Cornwall Wildlife Trust Marine Strandings Network, who are our partners, shows data shows that more seals are dying than ever before since records began. Our photo ID work shows a surprising number of adult males in their prime are dying and we need to, to find out why. So in summary, here are our key learning points. They're listed here. Basically, the most important one is that we are impacting on their health, welfare and mortality. So we need to do something about it. This is what drives us in Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust. Back in 1999, I knew nothing about seals and began surveying in 2000. So how did we go from just me to the amazing citizen science network that we are now? Well, we talked to lots of people, primary, secondary, colleges, university, family events and adult conferences. We have a pop up mobile marine centre that can tour local events and festivals, but it now needs a semi permanent southwest home if you've got any ideas. We learn to deliver content online, which is critically important and growing our network faster than ever. And working in partnership is critical. Here we are with ghost net busters to remove a giant plastic buoy that was breaking up on the seal haul out beach. I feared that in 20 years time, it might be part of millions of zooplankton working its way up the food chain to us. So it's not about competition. It's about growing our shared audience to gain critical mass for action to save the planet. And our work with local marine groups including the two that are featured today, has been absolutely critical in achieving this. We aim to keep all people involved, informed and connected through monthly newsletters. You can sign up if you want, annual reports, journal publications and in books. We feature in all these, these books here, only one of which we instigated and Septimus appears in the Beak, Tooth and Claw book and my leadership appears in the Marine Conservation book. We talk to people nationally through following up connections that influential people make with us. We are founding members of the SEAL Network UK, a statutory group reporting to DEFRA, the Marine Mammal Disturbance Partnership set up by Natural England. We're on the Clean Catch UK National Steering Group and I chair the SEAL Alliance Disturbance Working Group. This spreads our influence and shares expertise where it is needed most. For us, every SEAL counts. And we share this information with four global agencies as marine issues all require global solutions. In the 21st century, an organisation needs to be agile and Belinda Waldock's book will tell you how to become faster, smarter and more agile and leaner. We don't believe in power, having power. We believe in connectivity. Messages need to convey hope and positivity. It's important not to step on the toes of other people, to, but to focus on the knowledge gaps and the specialisms that we have. Like everyone else, we make mistakes, but we openly admit them, learn and move on. We understand that we cannot always give people the black and white answers that they want. The world is complicated, but if we take the time to explain this, people make their own informed decisions now and into the future. It's important to complete something if you say you will do it, but it's even more important to value the individual, be that a person or a seal. People often think I do seals, but actually the most important thing I do is people. You need your organisation to have plenty of emotionally intelligent people. Aim to get better at this, it's key. 
Make time for people, even when you're snowed under, you are never too busy for a person. Appreciate that you learn more from people who are not like you. This can be uncomfortable and hard, but empathising with different sides leads to more effective solutions. Malcolm's Gladwell bestseller book, The Tipping Point, says effective leaders are connectors. It's not a great book, but it's a great concept. Keep learning. Every day is a school day for me. I still learn Sealy firsts even after 20 years. Be a people person. Learn about the people around you, what they like, what skills do they have and what motivates them. I learned about Kate Williams from her husband. This is not her husband. He offered her services and I stupidly asked something like, oh, is she any good with IT? He answered that she designed accounting software. For four years, Kate ran our Ghost Gear database voluntarily and she is now our volunteer photo ID coordinator, a critical role in our organisation. I first met Dave Jenkins, who is in the photo, uh, at a conference and he asked me if there was anything he could do to help. He has been routinely recording his local seals in North Devon since 2009. We always start small, sm slow and simple, but things grow fast in the right environment. Always appreciate what people do and accept their constructive criticism and act on it. You don't ever work with people tomorrow if you don't engage with them today. So when Leslie Fit from Sea Changers visited us, she told me she managed company accounts. She is now our volunteer treasurer. A sentence that changed my life was every seal has a unique fur pattern. But a book that changed my life was Mark Sanborn's The Fred Factor. I learned that you have to exceed people's expectations and go above and beyond with your service. This is hard work, takes over your life and becomes addictive. So you have been warned. We all need to be mindful and take every chance to help everyone enjoy respect and protect our precious marine environment. But always acknowledge the contributions of others, shout about it to make them feel appreciated and good. Top tips then, to summarise, what are my top tips? Remember where you started. I still survey twice a week, so I know what it's like to be a grassroots surveyor out in the rain, in the wind, most like most of our volunteers. Rules are made to be broken by seals and people, and there will always be exceptions. Good Beachmaster seals have taught me to focus on the end game. Win wars, not battles. Only fight if it is actually worth it. When you have too much to do all the time, focus on your mission and your core values to prioritise. Connect. If in doubt, cut people in, not out. Involve them and let them make the decision to opt out if they wish. If people do well, encourage them to take on more because they can always say no. And realise that you are but a passing entity in this world and that you are never irreplaceable. So be humble and plan to be replaced by sorting out your infrastructure, personnel, strategies, processes and succession. So, got a passion? Got a dream? If so, our planet needs you. Just do it. Don't assume somebody else will. If you do something for 30,000 hours, you become an expert. But well before that, you know heaps about something more than your peers. So go for it. Look us up online, website, social media and YouTube. There are 18 more talks there if you haven't had enough already. So please support us. Treat yourself to our online shop. Join our Wild Seal Supporter Scheme. It's our modern take on a membership and adoption scheme or donate. Donate to Sea Changers, more importantly. And thank you to every one of our volunteers who've made this network of achievements possible. Our local community-based photo ID hubs do all the things listed on the left-hand side. We can't represent SEALs to the Environment Minister and the Parliamentary Undersecretary for the Environment as we have done this month. They've both been down to visit us without our hard work from all of our volunteers. So thank you. And please provide feedback on this talk. It helps with future funding, even with sea changes. Follow the link or the QR code. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Sue. There's so many life lessons, passion for the environment, and uh, just such an extraordinary uh, journey that you've taken. So I can't wait to get to the session at the end where we get to discuss your experience in, in more detail and 
certainly got a lot to learn uh, from you and uh, all your incredible volunteers. So thank you. Um, the next presentation um, is from uh, Gabriella Gilks from Newquay Marine Group. Uh, this is a group that was founded in 2013 as a voice for the coastal environment and has grown to um, 200 members strong. Their focus is on joining up the fishers, surfers and beach users with environmental agencies and wildlife groups to create a collective voice for protecting and celebrating the coastline around the town of Newquay on the north coast of Cornwall for you, those of you who are not familiar with the area. Over to you, Gabby. Thanks, Heather. Thanks for the lovely intro. Um, so uh, I'm one of the co-founders um, of, our, of our group, along with two other lovely ladies. Um, and I'm going to share a bit about our story today of who we are and, and how we got here. So, um, as it says on the event tin, um, we were set up in 2013 by a group of passionate locals with a common interest. Um, and that was to share, promote, protect, and learn about Newquay's amazing environment. Um, our objectives were uh, and are to celebrate and protect, to engage the public, to work with other groups, to influence and be a voice for the marine environment and be fun and inclusive for all. And it was just so nice to revisit that for this presentation and realize that we wouldn't change a thing now from when we wrote that constitution back then. Um, the other thing that really occurred to me while I was putting together the slides is how many lives um, and careers have sort of evolved along with the group. So this is Toby and Titan who appeared on our first ever leaflet for the group um, and Toby is now a, a bonnie 14 year old surf lifesaver. Um, so this is how we might look on any given month, um, COVID allowing, as we meet normally in a pub um, in the town uh, or on Zoom. We typically have between 20 and 40 people attending every meeting, which means it's quite hard to be heard in the pub but um, we feel incredibly lucky. We're a big active group um, and we have um, a real diversity um, of ages. Uh, that's because we've got the college with some um, ecology focused groups. We've got um, a working harbor and boat users. We've got retired naturalists, teachers, um, and obviously of course they're dogs that join us every month. So that's what we look like now. Um, but this is where it all started uh, with, with this exact album um, stuck into the CD deck of a carpool stereo. Carpools are a very Cornish necessity. Uh, we've got long distances to travel and we have a really poor transport network down here. But uh, it's quite amazing to me the sort of deep collaboration and commitment that you get if you're forced to listen to repetitive um, shaggy or shakademus and pliers. So we very quickly conversations flowed um, as we turn this off. And so I just finished a master's degree with Plymouth University in Spain in water and coastal management. Um, another carpool sharer was an environmental lawyer um, and an avid diver. Um, another one of us was a um, ocean lover and wild swimmer. And we, we couldn't understand why there wasn't a conservation group in Newquay already. Um, I still don't understand that today, actually. Um, but it was quite interesting times pre-2013 for Newquay. Um, it was still the party capital of the UK. And yet it had this amazing marine environment that not many people were shouting about. Um, and it was in one of the very early tranches of the Marine and Coastal Access Act to be proposed for a marine protected area around the coast of England. Um, I'd been working for the Finding Sanctuary um, bit, mapping um, users around the southwest to inform um, the proposals for marine conservation zones. It was a little bit contentious. Um, People, particularly fishermen, um, harbour users were worried that it was going to affect their livelihoods. So we started the group really as knowledge brokers, um, sort of information sharers. Government agencies weren't allowed to say things that might happen and we knew a little bit about it. So we were able to go to meetings and, and help in that knowledge gap. Um, so that really was, was where we started. And because it was pre um, the proposal, we were also able as a group to input a lot of evidence 
um, about how amazing Newquay was and its habitats um, and creatures and, and um, surveys that we believe helped get it over the line, or we hope helped get it over the line, and it became designated as a marine conservation zone in 2016. Um, so we started with our stakeholders, um, and they are many and varied. Uh, we took about two years going around Newquay meeting everybody, which was often but not always fun. We cover about 17 miles of coastline between Morganporth and Holywell, and that includes seven town beaches and about the same on the outskirts and all the coves and coastlines in between. Newquay's on the International Surf Circuit. Um, it has a working aquarium. It has an, um, an active inshore fishery. Um, it's very popular tourist destination and back to those um, hen and stag parties that I mentioned earlier. Um, they Stakeholders don't always get on, which means that it's never, never boring, always interesting. Um, but it really paid dividends getting to know everybody in, in the very beginning. And here is the very beginning. This is us as we started, wondering whether anyone would show up to our events, um, getting our mates on board, literally. Um, and it's we just had such brilliant people around. So people from the aquarium, people from the college, people from the Wildlife Trust, people from the, the SEAL group that really helped us. Um, and it's so cheering that every single one of those people in that first event is still part of the group today, eight years on. Um, including Amber, who's smashing it as a postdoc in London um, in deep sea exploration. So a little bit about what we do, what we're really proud of, just a taster. Um, we do science, and I say that very deliberately. Um, I think some of the most interesting science that's done is at grassroots level and in, in localities by local people. Um, that means we sometimes tag on to um, partake in national protocols. So like the, wild, uh, the Wildlife Trust Living Seas. So we can do monthly um, wildlife surveys, uh, species IDs, and, and this can input into a national database or an international database and really help add to the body of evidence. Um, other times we want to lead research. And this is one example where our, um, our other co-founder, Liz, who does all our monthly beach cleans, was really interested in microplastics in the marine environment. So she went online, she looked at the state of research globally, she got in touch with a group in the US and persuaded them to lend us the Manta, um, the Mantanet uh, codend and the an uh, analysis equipment. And she sat at a conference that we have every year with all the wildlife groups and got everyone around the table and said, are you in? Um, and everyone was in. So we all do this together with both the other groups. Um, uh, on the presentations today, and we're 30 trawls in now, um, we've done hundreds of analyses, we've been able to estimate as a group um, the amount of microplastics in the environment between St Agnes and um, uh, St Agnes and St um, Padstow, and that sounds a bit depressing, but actually it's really important, and um, although there's a lot, the Cornish Sea is actually quite pristine uh, internationally when compared with other areas, so good to know. Um, some of the other stuff that we get involved in, it's a real can-do group. Whatever needs doing, we just get on with it. Somebody will take the mantle. So anything from collecting bottle tops for another group that are going to be taken to lobby Parliament in Westminster to um, getting recycling bodyboard bins put all around the coasts, um, starting plastic-free um, new key. All of this um, it was pretty much never done in isolation. It's really hard to know what we started or what came from somewhere else. And it really doesn't matter at the end of the day for us, as long as it gets done. Um, something else that we do, we didn't necessarily intend to do, um, is landscape work and restoration. So along with some other friends, we started Friends of, friends of Fistral Dunes. Um, this is a really pressured uh, dune system in Newquay. Um, we've tried to stabilise it, plant marum grass, um, educate the public about it with enormous amount of um, exposure in the media um, and some mixed success there. Or uh, this other one, which is my baby, is the Harbour Heights area in Newquay, which was a, a prime bit of real estate um, above the harbour. Very unloved, uh, pretty derelict. And in the last uh, few years, we've been able to plant coastal arrangements with Newquay in Bloom, 
we've put interpretation boards there so that you can sit and know what wildlife you're looking at and spotting. Um, we've resurfaced it, repainted it and commissioned um, community murals that celebrate the heritage and the history of the place. It's a real build it and, and you will come story because we didn't expect to do this, but quite often people come to us and ask us to take on something that needs doing or people come to us and ask us to apply for some money to get things done or give us some money. Um, it was always really important to us um, to do this and we have a very active program around throughout the year. We do social events and talks throughout winter uh, for our members and the public. That's Gillian again, um, one of our talks. Um, we're active on the beaches in summer. Thanks to Sea Changes, we were able to run beach rangers over several years and that was helping visitors and locals alike um, really celebrate and get to know the wonderful creatures that share our shores. Um, we work with school kids. We got a grant recently to um, take kids that otherwise wouldn't be able to out on wildlife safaris. Um, we run beach cleans throughout the year and people come from all over the county to do those. And we even have our own exhibit in a, in a visitor centre that hundreds of thousands come to visit every year. And um, perhaps most importantly of all to me anyway, um, is to, to celebrate and have fun. There's, there's so much joyousness in the group. And I think that's the, the glue that binds it all together. Um, so I'm always on everybody to, to get out there and get in the water and do the stuff that we really enjoy doing because we, we spend so much time um, putting on stuff for other people. And we all, most of us have full-time jobs and do this just as, as volunteers. So um, yeah, fun. Um, and perhaps because of all of this, we get more than our fair share, I'd say, of media attention. We've had films made. Um, we've appeared in, in um, national coastal magazines. And every once in a while, we have a go at writing a scientific paper. Um, I, I don't know if um, we have influenced um, a change in Newquay, but Newquay's been on a massive renaissance um, over the last 10 years, 15 years or so. Um, and it really is, it's gone from that stag and party capital to a place that really celebrates its environment and its wildlife um, and its culture. Um, and whether we've influenced or just been on the ride, um, it's just been such a privilege to see that happen um, and to watch um, our little group go from being the new kids on the block to part of the establishment. So um, I've had a really exciting career in, in marine conservation and worked all over the world. And this is the thing that I'm the proudest of, I think, in my life. Um, and we call it the Newquay Marine Group family. So um, I think we all really do feel like that. And it's a support network for us all. Um, so, so that's it from me. Um, I just wanted to say a massive thank you um, to the other groups, to our amazing members and volunteers and to funders like Sea Changers and for holding events like these. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabby. What a wonderful story. And uh, and just to see the it taking you in directions that you didn't anticipate and achieving so much. And, and I'm sure you are part of that overall change. It's certainly uh, contributing to that. And that sense of momentum, I think, it, it is so important. But anyway, we'll dig into that um, at the end of all the present uh, presentations. Um, please do <clears throat> put any questions that you have into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the um, Zoom screen, and uh, we'll get to those afterwards. But while you're thinking of them and we've got them fresh in your mind. So last, but by no means least, um, we have a pre presentation from Tina Robinson and Kathy Alford from Polzeth Marine Conservation Group. Uh, the presentation will be given by Tina, but I know that Kathy is also um, available for questions and, and here joining us today. Um, this group is a small voluntary organisation based at the Villages Marine Centre with a growing network of rangers, volunteers and supporters. Um, it does a huge amount of conservation work in the community, um, working on science, education, influence and action. Over to you, Tina. Um, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so my name's Tina Robinson uh, and along with Cathy, who's listening, um, 
uh, we've been <clears throat> we've been with the Poles Earth Marine Centre since it was first really officially constituted in um, in 2012. And if I can just say thank you to Sea Changers for inviting us to, to to be part of their amazing festival. Um, that's great. Thank you. So if I can just share my screen. So this is our logo, um, but it's Poles Earth Marine Centre. We're actually just um, a few miles up the coast from Newquay. Um, yeah. So. That says. Um, and Sea Changers gave us an incredible donation that kickstarted our water refill station project. Uh, and ours was actually, don't listen to anybody else, it was the first uh, unit on a beach in the country. Uh, and the first year we put it in, we saw 10,000 litres drawn off. Um, the cost of this tap water is about 20 pounds, but you can imagine 10,000 litres. The, the reduction in single use plastic was priceless. So if I can just show you our video. I'm so proud, this is amazing. This means we don't need to have plastic bottles on our beach going into our beautiful oceans. Let's all stop using plastic bottles. <laughs> I'm a surfing person and I'm so pleased that there's a refill station and I don't have to buy plastic bottles for my drinks, it's brilliant. <clears throat> that takes us back, Kathy, doesn't it? <laughs> so this was the opening of our Rock One uh, in July in 2018, and we, we have our local MP there right next to it, of course. Um, so that was uh, a great opening. Um, and then we had uh, the Polzeth One, which was actually first. So that's all our lovely volunteers. And you might, might recognise the guy in the back who is from uh, Doc Martin. <clears throat> So <clears throat> this, these are our main activities. Um, we have a beach ranger. This is a, an initiative started by um, our proactive chair who you saw in the previous video. So for the last, I would think four years, we've uh, managed to raise funds to accommodate a, a, a summer beach ranger. And some years we've actually had two. And these helpers, uh, these uh, girls, boys, they are usually marine biology students um, and they help us to engage with the public. As you can see, we're all um, um, past our youth, I should say, uh, and they bring us into the 21st century. And, and I don't think we could manage without them. They keep our marine centre open throughout the summer. Uh, Rockpool Rambles, I suppose that's been our our main activity since we started really. And pre-COVID, we had about 70 people on each of our rock pool rambles. And because of COVID, we, we, we uh, started to take out family groups, maximum of six. And I think this is the way to go really. Uh, and we aim to continue in small groups of up to six and we've refined our methods of, um, I suppose, showing and telling amazing crabs and the wildlife that we've got in our, um, our uh, rock pools. <clears throat> we're, we're really keen on school visits and we've, um, and we've got a, a member of the committee who uh, coordinates our school visits and by the end of this, uh, by the end of July, we'll have done three school visits from local primary schools and um, it's uh, fantastic and really rewarding um, and I think that's not a, a bad um, achievement and it's just coming out of Covid. And as we've heard about our amazing um, surveys that um, all the marine centres and particularly Cornwall Seal Group organise um, and um, 
um, Paul's Admin Centre manage to finance one of these um, every year. And of course, we partake in the microplastic trawling. Something that we've started, thanks to Cathy Alford, and we do this in conjunction with Cornwall Wildlife Trust, we've just started species surveys. And we've just found out that actually these were done um, 15 years ago as well, and all the records still exist. So that would be amazing, the fact that we've just picked it up in 15, year, uh, in 15 years to see the change that, uh, over, that over that period. Um, Litter pigs, so this is something um, that now the Marine Centre has taken on. So I'm, I'm actually the representative for Keep Britain Tidy. And so a lot of our litter pigs are now um, coordinated from the Marine Centre. And, and, and even if it's pouring with rain, we have an amazing response. And we can see in that picture, probably not, we've got a motorcycle um, seat that somebody found um, on our beach. We don't know what happened to the the rest of the bike, but I think you heard, I don't know, it was on the news, we had a car floating in Polzeth Beach, I think on Monday. Craft events, again, Kathy's there, um, and we do this on a regular a weekly basis, and of course our, um, our um, beach ranger helps us with this, um, and that helps us, especially on a rainy day, we're lucky enough to have um, a, a, a structure, a marine centre, so um, Kathy and her colleague Di, uh, organize that on a weekly basis. Every year, I think you've seen one of the pictures that uh, the Nuki uh, group shown, um, that Gabriella showed was actually on one of our Marine Discovery Days where we coordinate with lots of groups and um, we all come together on Poles Earth Beach and that, that looks like a particularly nice day. Of course, we've missed two years now, but um, we aim to be present and uh, um, be, be there in 2022. And this is a, a children's painting, actually. It was um, some uh, an idea that came forward, I think it was from the Channel Islands, actually, that uh, during COVID, when we couldn't do rock pool rambles, we couldn't really fully open, we had um, family groups painting um, um, outside. And uh, we had the whole of this fence. I think we had something like 500 paintings on that fence. Um, and um, the children just, just loved it, and the adults, actually. Yeah. And we've saved a few of these, and we've already started. So that fence is getting uh, even more um, busier this year. Um, this is our beach ranger. So this was, I've actually said it was her first day, but it, it is, she's been with us about two weeks now. Um, and just opening up our centre and doing all the maintenance, helping us with the maintenance there, um, getting ready for our visitors this summer. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm, I'm quite proud and I, I'm sure Cathy feels the same of just being involved with Poles Eth Marine Centre and being part of this am amazing network that really, um, you know, can be replicated anywhere anywhere in the UK, you know, we're, we're never very far from the sea. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Tina. That was uh, incredibly just showing how also that you've adapted to still be delivering amazing projects and amazing work around the marine environment, even through the COVID um, pandemic, which has been so challenging for so many people. But I think the outside world and the ocean in particular has been so restorative too to um, so many of us during this time. Um, I'd love to get all the panelists to come turn your cameras on and um, talk through some, um, some questions. Um, I, anybody please do put any questions in the chat, but um, I think that was just an incredible run through, I think, um, of, of what difference um, everybody can make. Um, the sea changer has, obviously catalyzed a huge amount for all of these groups and many, many more. Um, but also that's just been the motivation to, to sort of really enable that incredible change. But I, I wanted to ask um, each of you um, if you were to say to somebody who was thinking about starting a group um, about what they're passionate about, um, what advice would you, you give them um, 
So maybe maybe start with you, you Sue. So Gabby hit the nail on the head for me and I didn't say it. It was that you need to have fun. <clears throat> if you don't enjoy what you do, you don't carry on doing it. And the second top tip would be um, to start small and don't shout about it until you've got something to shout about. <laughs> So, you know, just carry on doing what you're doing, get some mates around you, work together, set up a bit of a group, start to formalise, but don't start shouting about what you're doing until you've got something really useful to say. Great. Gabby, do you want to add to that? Um, I, I'd say get get to know your neighbours, your stakeholders. I think, I think Sue mm. said it, look at us <laughs> um, praising each other, but... Um, yeah, don't step on any toes. There'll be lots of people doing good and similar stuff. Um, and if you don't have an ego about it, if you're working for a greater good, then there's always real pleasure in that. And it doesn't matter who started something or, or finished it, really. Brilliant. Yes, that, that adopts my no no egos or logos <laughs> policy. Um, ah, I like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's passion, I think. You know, um, all of us here in Earth are just passionate about where we live we just love it here my heart is here and so for me it's all about passion and I think if you are passionate you will find a way through your problems um you know surround yourself with like-minded people and, and and a bucking up brigade and and you'll get there but you know try lovely thank you uh, so we've got a question here from Sue um inspiring talks thank you couldn't agree more um Presumably most of your volunteers are local residents. Are there ways to get lots of visitors helping, um, giving, especially given the big increase in staycations? Um, so Gabby, I'll start with you, um, talking about those uh, hen and stag parties and how you do with, with that. Yeah, um, well, you know, interestingly, a lot of our um, events are, are mixed, a, a pretty even mix actually, especially when we're out out there on the beaches rather than it being something that people sign up to and of course as, as Sue and Tina have mentioned um, actually the pandemic's been a, a huge opportunity for reaching much wider audiences we only cover Newquay but now online anyone that's interested in a talk we've organised can can get involved um, so yeah I think just build it and they will come actually and realise that you can't please all the people all the time but um, Put, put stuff out there that you're interested in and um, I think I think all these types of groups particularly because they're working together are reaching those people because they're out and about. Right Tina I think you touched on some of the activities that you're, you're doing that sounded like they included visitors but can you expand? Yeah uh, a lot of our work in the summer is all based on um, families and engagement with the public and, and Poles Eth like Nuki has an enormous, I think we have something like three quarters of a million people go through Poles Eth every summer and, you know, they do engage with us, they do come in our Marine Centre and they do take, you know, we get inspiration from them and hopefully they take some of that um, away with them really to where they live. Um, yeah, and, and we get um, inspiration from them much, much more so probably. Brilliant. So you politely had your hand up. <laughs> so. Can't raise it on the screen, but I can do it physically. <laughs> and I just like to say that you can volunteer no matter where you live in the world, really, to help marine conservation in Cornwall or on your own patch. Uh, you can do both. Um, we um, photo ID means that you can be doing it at home, and your home can be anywhere around the world, thanks to the internet. So we've got online training for volunteers now, uh, and we try and tier our volunteering to people's preferences so some people actually like to write reports other people prefer to look at photos so you don't actually physically have to be here to be able to help with the cause you can do that you know crowd crowdsourcing kind of volunteering uh, and the other thing is we're also happy for people to attend our training just to set up their own group if they want help in how to do that we can do that too and we also provide training in crowdfunding as well. So if that's something that you're interested in, we can help out with that. It's all about growing this audience and trying to help each other to do that, because we're generally a lot of the time, not always, especially you guys preaching to the converted. You do engage new audiences as we try desperately to. But what we need is millions and millions and millions of people to act 
in a small way to make the difference. So yeah, please do volunteer, get in touch, marion at cornwallsealgroup.co.uk, get on our online volunteer training. We had somebody from America, in fact, we've had two people from America who both volunteer with us now. So location is no longer a limitation. <laughs> Amazing. Start local, go global <laughs> from the sounds of it. And I, I think it is really interesting actually how things have changed with the, um, as we've adapted to an online environment. And, and while that's been challenging in many ways, I think the opportunities and the, the ways that we can engage in different ways and, and bring um, a, a global community through a screen, there's, it's also been a, a phenomenal sharing opportunity. Um, so I think it's very easy um, to talk about success and to champion everything that you've um, achieved. And that certainly is phenomenal, but um, I sort of imagine, and certainly if I reflect on my experience in marine conservation, that probably hasn't all gone totally perfectly along the way. So um, I wonder if um, you could share uh, things that you, I, I, I heard a term actually that I, I take a lot of comfort from, which is um, successful failure. So I think there's no such thing as a complete failure, but that we we learn from what we we has gone wrong. Um, but I wonder if you could you could share an example of, of of maybe a regret or something that didn't go quite as planned, and and what you learned from it and what came out the other side. Um, so I'll, I'll start with you, Tina, as you're unmuted. Um, oh, am I? Am I yeah. Um, I don't know what, what Kathy would say actually, but I think we've sort of. I think we look, had a second look at our, the way we conducted our Rockpool Rambles and come up with a much, much better um, uh, way of proceeding and protecting actually the habitat, that are they, the, the, the sea creatures we were supposed to be uh, protecting anyway. So we've cut down, as I said before, from about 70 people, which is amazing if you think you can get 70 people down on these uh, protected shores, but actually that just the numbers were so huge. So we've we learned from that and now we are so very very careful about um replacing the crabs in exactly the same position and um you know it's um you know and and when they see us do that when the public see us do that they realize how important it is if you have a bucket full of crabs you know you you can't really just put them in any old pool and i think um that was a way that we learned and overcome that problem, but that was thanks to COVID and revising our methods. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, Gabby? Um, well, two quick things, I suppose. Um, one, when we started, we had a real aspiration to um, include all the tribes. We really wanted to um, be a, a, to bring the surfers in to, to wider marine conservation and the fishermen and the harbour users. Um, and we wanted to sort of make um, sustainable seafood uh, in Newquay really big. And actually, that hasn't happened in the way that we imagined. Um, I'm sort of happy to say that we haven't lost those stakeholders, but um, we learned a lot about different tribes and, and aesthetics. Um, you know, people do have slightly separate identities and um, that's fine. You know, you can't. Um, to my other point is, as I said already, you can't please all the people all the time. Not all stakeholders get on and there are moments of contention. Um, and there actually is quite a lot of criticism sometimes when you do something for public good, which really surprised us. Um, and, you know, just take that on the chin and, ro and roll with it um, and keep smiling and, and do the things that you, you, you think are important and then it's fine. Great. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting those reactions that you get that you don't expect, but I think that that's also the power of working as a group, isn't it, you, you, that you've got friends to to lean on and that sense of family goes through, I think, the the, the good times and the bad of, of working together and finding a path through it. So, Sue, have you... Uh, anything yeah, um, gone wrong for you <laughs> a lot. absolutely shed loads yes for sure but you learn from it that's the thing you know I love that phrase successful failure I've not heard that before but you're right it's cr critical uh, so I think because I'm a passionate person I can be very driven by my heart and what I've learned is to not react with my heart so I can feel it going when I'm in a difficult situation, I can feel it going and I know what I want to come out of my mouth and it's usually expletives, but you just have to silence that heart um, and you genuinely then have to listen. So when you're hearing something you really don't want to hear, 
or you really didn't expect. It happened this week with me, really hot off the press kind of stuff, and uh, it was very painful to sit through, but you just have to have one guiding principle, and that's about being kind. Because you, if you wouldn't say it to somebody's face, you shouldn't be saying it to them online. You shouldn't be putting it on social media. You need to think about how you would want to hear a response to that. You have to put yourself in other people's shoes. Their lives are very, very different from mine. And I need to understand what it's like to stand in those shoes, because if I don't, we will never get to a solution. So that's, I think, the key thing for me is to remember to be kind, not respond with your heart, go with your head when you've had time to think on it, usually when you've slept on it. And then, you know, make sure that you pull all those sides together, all those stakeholders to make suggestions for solutions, because those are the only effective ones in challenging circumstances. Yeah, and I think that's where the listening comes in so importantly, doesn't it? You know, it's sort of you don't necessarily need to agree with people, but if you've, as you said, you've understood a perspective and you've listened to that opinion, then you can look for sort of mutual solutions and way, ways through that's um, respectful for those. Um, so I, sort of lurking in the background of this call, uh, uh, Helen and Rachel from Sea Changes, and I, I just uh, would love you to turn on your cameras, partly because I think it must be incredible for you, started this journey sort of 10 years ago, um, with great, you know, ideas about what might happen, and then you're seeing what your funding and support has um, enabled for these incredible groups. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about your reaction to that, and also maybe sharing some of the challenges that you've had a, along the journey. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks, Heather. Um, uh, actually, listening to the other speakers, you know, it, there's a lot of. Um, uh, familiar themes I think as well for us because I think um, you know certainly um, something that Sue said which was just just do it was kind of um, you know what we thought uh, I suppose when we first started Sea Changes was that um, as as divers we saw a lot of the problems that were happening in the marine environment but at that time 10 years ago actually there wasn't a, nearly as much awareness of uh, public awareness of and we were seeing problems and we felt helpless and you know what what can we do about it and in the end we thought actually we we um were inspired by another another charity that was working in 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 the way we thought sea changes would work which was a charity called street smart um which uh was kind of collecting money in local restaurants and hotels from customers and then distributing it to uh to um small grassroots homeless projects and hostels and we thought why can't we do something similar for the marine environment and that's where the idea of sea changes came um and and so you know that 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 side of it's been it's interesting because actually in a way although we our idea uh was sort of something we wanted to do at a sort of UK wide level. It's very similar to sort of the group, the groups, you know, which is okay. No one else is doing this. We can't rely on anyone else to do it. So we better get on and try and do it. And that's what we tried to do and, and setbacks. Yeah. I, I would say there are many times when um, we thought it wasn't ever going to happen, I think. And that, uh, you know, we went knocking on doors, trying to recruit um, company uh, partners and we thought I think at the beginning we thought you know why wouldn't marine based businesses really want to partner with a marine conservation charity that's helping local marine groups um, why wouldn't that why wouldn't they want to do that and the, and the answer often was not they're just not interested you know it's not it's not what they're about and they and and as well I think marine conservation was not the cause it was uh, then as it is now I think it is is now seen as important and something the public cares about so things have really changed we had endless uh, doors closed in our faces really uh, and setbacks and definitely did lots of things wrong but I think um, eventually you know it, it has started to happen and really I think one of the things I would say is you have to have patience actually and determination because actually you know we we lots of times felt like you know it, it might be something we should give up on but in the last couple of years I think that certainly changed 
um, and we feel you know really proud of what's happening. And the, these events and hearing from um, from you know the, the groups that we've helped is you know so satisfying for us because we often don't get to see we you know give out the grants we do get evaluation information back but um when when we go to see the groups and go and meet the the people who are running that's when we really get a buzz from it because you actually see what's happening um and and hearing about it as well in all of these events has been fantastic uh, makes it you know definitely makes it all worthwhile and all and all of that hard work at the beginning has definitely felt a lot a lot you know fully worthwhile um great well yeah. well i think um the next decade is is uh, very exciting so you can't stop now that's uh, no. that that's for sure um there's a you know um question on on how do you go about choosing the projects you know obviously um, a number of these might be at their early stages or you know they're volunteer led and and how do you have that sort of um you know for people who are, are listening that might not feel confident about applying for such funding you know how, how do you go about selecting which projects to support and is it for anybody or do you have to have an official status or something like that um, so yeah, we have a um, evaluation panel, um, and uh, again, that's um, our, a number of our trustees um, and our, our, the trustees of Sea Changes, many of whom have you know relevant experience in marine conservation. We also have on that panel our scientific advisor, who was speaking at our other event last night, which is Helen Scales who um so not all of the projects would need a scientific advisor but i think where we're not sure about impacts and uh, not sure about the the sort of uh marine bio, bio biology implications of what we're uh, of what we're looking at what we're evaluating we we have her advice as well and we have a set of criteria and we score and the panel will score the applications we get in and that's how we decide um mostly we do um, for our main grants fund, you, you, you know, we do um, only really give grants to non-profit organisations. Um, but uh, on occasion, that has been a kind of startup, uh, a really, really um, small local group of people um, who are maybe a very start of their, you know, constituting themselves, but who just need a little bit of seed funding to kind of get going um like like Nuke and marine group actually i think one of the you know one of our uh, first grants was to Nuke and marine group when they were really were in that early startup phase so you don't necessarily need to be an established group and that i mean i think that's one of the things we found really important about what we do as opposed to other marine conservation going on we firmly believe that it is about local communities getting involved and in order to do that you can't really insist that they're sort of you know organizations with you know three years of accounts and and all of those kind of things we, you know we can't we can't do that um so so um yeah as long as you're not in it to make a profit for our main grants fund um then yeah go ahead and apply and we're, we're really keen to see we would love to see groups that we see in cornwall um all over the uk and be funding those and, and funding them to start up so that groups like the poles ethmarine center and the marine group and and um and sue's project you know if we're relevant where there are sealed populations that they're popping up all over yeah i think one of the uh, ideas we were having was a, a twinning idea so if anybody wants to be matched with one of the groups that um are presenting here today then please do follow up afterwards and we'll see what we can do to make that happen i think we'd love to shortcut uh, through some of the challenges that people have had and share you know successful ideas and things that work or expand data collection um to fill knowledge gaps and and i think you know that's a huge thing gabby i just wondered did you want to respond to that point about your um first sea changes grant yes thank you because i didn't put it in the talk but actually um that was the crucial tipping point i think for us to become um a real group because we were um we've been meeting stakeholders and um and, and knowledge gapping and and then um you know, Helen and Rachel did some research, found us, talked to us, and it, it gave us it, that valuing that enabled us to think, hang on, this this is something worth, let's let's do this. And it kind of kickstarted us to have our constitution and, and officially form as a group. So thank you. And I just thought I'd, I'd share that because I think we all do need that beginning bit where it just tips us over the line. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's that early days when you you don't have the the confidence. You're building that knowledge. You're building up the hours. You're finding your way in your niche. And um, I think if you get a vote of confidence, and particularly uh, from a funder, you know it's an incredible boost to the the mission and passion that you have to get stuff done, and enables you to to actually do stuff. Which uh, um, you know I think that's one of one of the the big challenges that um, we all have. It is all volunteer led and. And that was a question we had is, um, you know, how do you attract those volunteers to, to, to help you? So, um, uh, yes, Sue, you obviously mentioned you, you're now actually recruiting and I know you've put the contact details in the chat, but presumably at the start, it was a bit more, of, was that just word of mouth or? Um... So it was friends and I had a very selfish reason for starting as well because somebody had a video of a seal and I wanted to see it. So I invited them round with other people to come and look at seal photos and videos. I just happened to have a set of aims drawn up for a group at the same time. And that was our very first meeting in my lounge here in the room downstairs. Uh, I was gonna pick up on something that um, Helen and Rachel said, which is about patience because um, it's critical really. Uh, and the great news is they're at 10 years, because in my experience, although I'm a bit of a slow, you know, slow starter, I don't really appreciate the importance of marketing. So I hadn't until recently. So I think you can do it faster than this. But in my experience, nobody notice you, notices you for about the first seven years. So you just have to keep going on your own momentum and your own motivation to kind of keep going. 10 years, people really start listening and it starts to get easier which is great news for you guys. Uh, 15 years, you know, statutory agencies um, are really starting to take notice and get interested and you're out there and people really want to ask you stuff. And by 20 years, you've got parliamentary ministers coming to want to visit because you've got information that they feel is useful. But it does, you know, it's that long thing. Uh, you know, if you're in it for the short term, the chance of success is limited if you're in it for the long term because you love it and you're having fun then you have a massive roller coaster ride of fabulous experiences uh, that just keep you going that's a great way a roller coaster ride of fabulous experiences i think <laughs> i think i'll use that i'll give you successful failure and i'm going to take that one for sure but uh, i think that's an interesting way of uh, in response to one of the questions that we've had about how will you know what you've achieved what you set out to do well i think you've, you've sort of just having ministerial visits and and you know turning your um your, you know your data into policy is, is a huge way of recognizing that but um tina i want you know do you feel that you've set out you've achieved what you set out to do um do you sort of reflect on that or is it sort of a more organic um evolution and, and and Kathy please do uh, feel to chip chip in if you if you'd like to I think we're we're sort of growing as each year you know for, um our beach ranger said the other day we can do what is it silent beach cleaning discos or something and we found out that Cornwall Wildlife Trust have got these amazing headphones with three options for music so you can borrow this equipment you can select your music dance everybody can do, and dance on little pick at the same time. So who knows what's out there? I mean, and you know, we've just started our beach ranger, went on a snorkeling um, safari course with Cornwall Wildlife Trust. So now we're hoping to do snorkeling safaris, but you know, who would have, who would have thought that in 2012 really? And I think it's important, uh, Helen and Rachel mentioned about seed funding. You know, once you do have a little pot of money particularly for the water refill project, you know, in the end, we had people offering us money, you know, once people hear about your project and, and, and they want to get involved if they think it's worthwhile. So I think that seed funding for groups that want to get started, um, whatever, whether it's a new project or a new group is, um, is, 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 is fantastic. I, I don't know whether Cathy has got any comments. Kathy's yeah. gone out with her with her um, uh, headphones to do a bit of silent. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Who would have thought of that? But obviously, Cornwall Wildlife just did. So we're coming to a beach near you to do a bit of disco dancing 
Um, well, if you want to come out this Sunday, <laughs> Mounts Bay Marine Group in Marisol. Well, there you go. A silent disco beach clean. Would Let, you please? Yeah. There's one ready Amazing. organized. Sounds like you. fun. So, yeah, with the yeah with the Cornwood Wildlife Trust, as you say. So yes, I think that uh, is also adding to the fun factor. Yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and then I guess from the science end of things, um, Keith has hi Keith. Great to have you joining us. Um, so he's uh, put the observations into the Southwest Marine Ecosystems Report, which is uh, gained from the um, fantastic contributions from the observations and data collected by the so many people working in these groups around um, the county and beyond. So there's a nice link there to, to look into to start to see how you con can contribute. And, and certainly from the sort of science perspective, you know, crowdsourcing this kind of information from across um, the UK and beyond and certainly um, with the work I do niche like sea on seals but with wider application on seahorses there's a, we have an I seahorse app which is recording seahorse sightings from around the world um, and so they, these sort of platforms that we can now use to to gain information just give us you know new observations new records new insights all the time um, of, of exactly what's going on so so fantastic to see. Um, so I guess um, probably uh, coming to, to, to the end, but... Um, Who's got a hand up? Sorry? Was, More questions? Yes, I was on. just going to add, Heather, about we've had a couple of mentions of Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and I really don't think it would be fair for us to ignore the kind of seminal involvement that they have also had in all of our success. Mm. So basically, they had a project. It was a national project called the Your Shore Project, and the Yorkshire project has linked all of our groups together, whether we're, you know, on whatever level we operate, but it's pulled us together. And then it's what it's also done is spread the groups to the gaps, the areas of coastline without groups. And that really, that um, model of encouraging local people on their local patch is what's, you know, that informed our work, but it's seminal in success. You know, you're much bigger than a single group if you've got yeah. the power of a, of a collaborative group. And we wouldn't have done that as easily and we wouldn't have done it as quickly without Cornwall Wildlife Trust your project. Gabby, here we go. Um, yeah, I was just going to say I from wonder why uh, it was news to me from Helen and Rachel that Cornwall was kind of so embedded and so networked and that's that that would be different from anywhere else. But um, I mean, apart from having beautiful coastline, um, it is quite a harsh environment as well. So I think I think that fosters real collaboration. And I don't think um, sort of money and ego is uh, is very lauded down here. So I, th I think that's a good thing, too. But yeah, absolutely. As, as Sue said, um, beyond that, um, the Yorkshire Network really has been amazing for all of us. Mm. That's useful um, in, t in terms of thinking, in terms of, you know, sort of how you scale this up sort of nationally and internationally. I, I know I heard an amazing presentation um, a couple of weeks ago by uh, Dr. Asha DeVos from Sri Lanka and her big motto is every coastline needs a hero. And that's exactly what you're describing. That's exactly what you all are on your own coastlines. But I think it is that network of thinking that there's those local champions, the, the heroes that are doing that work on the ground and, and making a difference. and. And the roles that whether it's Cornwall Wildlife Trust or, you know, the, the funding from Sea Changes, all of these ingredients of success is, is so important to understand better so we can speed things up. You know, we know um, and, and Sue so touched on how much trouble the, the coastline, um, you know, is in, in the ocean is in so many ways. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't have to do beach cleans because our beaches weren't, you know, littered with plastic. And, and you know, it, it, it is a very rapidly changing world so we're having to respond to that but by being proactive and putting the ocean on the agenda which I think has changed you know so much in the last few years is 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 um you know a momentum that we mustn't lose it needs to be something that does remain of interest to environment ministers it may an issue of importance to local government and to uh you know to our MPs and it becomes an issue that is important to everybody because it is um so um and yeah, I guess there are others will too um yes, yeah. yes absolutely absolutely um yeah I guess I guess to end 
you know, uh, for, from, from each of you um, and including Helen and Rachel in that, you know, uh, what are you most proud of? You know, what's the one thing when you think of um, that you're most proud of? Um, so I'll start with you, Sue. Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, um, Recognising that you're all horribly humble about your achievements. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think one of the, well, there are two things. One, that recognising that blue blindness exists. You know, for a lot of people, blue doesn't exist. We think green, but we don't think blue. That's one, having that realisation. But the other one is, um, I don't know if any of you have seen, there's a film called My Octopus Teacher by Off the Fence and Water Bear. Uh, they've just finished a film about seals in Cornwall and it's called Underwater Underdog and the title Underdog came from me because that's always been my driving force for seals. They weren't as well represented as cetaceans and they needed to be and they deserved it. So I think trying to uh, highlight the fact that they're not an underdog and they're as important as everything else has been a good achievement. Brilliant. That is amazing. Um, Gabby. Wow, that is amazing. Um, I think when we um, mark our success in sort of fun and celebration, it's quite easy to, um, to, to see when we're doing well. Um, but I, uh, my greatest um, love is the family element and we can sort of mark it in relationships. Um, it starts with wildlife and other species and it, and it ends up about humans and human connection, I think in the conservation world. And we can mark our success in, in weddings that we've had and, and kind of lifelong friendships that have been made. That's wonderful to hear. And Tina? <laughs> Much the same as um, Gabriella really, on a personal um, level, um, just all the friends and colleagues and, how support comes from um, your friends and colleagues and actually, you know, uh, strangers as well. It's so inspirational. And for Paul's Earth Marine Group, probably how we've grown from, you know, just, um, I'm incredibly proud of, of, of all the group, all the, all our members and how we all get together and, and, and it's all, it's all for the protection of our oceans that we all love. Fantastic. And Helen, you get the last comment on this. Uh, what are you most proud of? Uh, well, that's really easy, actually. Um, I, think, I think what I'm most proud of is the fact we've seen lots of very small groups grow into much bigger groups uh, over the last 10 years. So um, you know, part of the joy of this festival has been hearing from groups who've really uh, have, have been really tiny and talked about that that funding that we gave, which might have been £500, might have been £1,200, but actually that was the start of something quite, you know, momentous um, and more examples of that here today. And I think from our point perspective, we couldn't imagine that, you know, uh, that, that um, those small amounts of money that we really scrabbled around for uh, eight or nine years ago have made such a big difference to people where they're now involved in projects which, you know, are so far ranging, uh, whether it's in terms of, you know, the numbers of people involved or whether it's in terms of, the impact of the conservation that's involved. So uh, definitely hugely proud of that. It doesn't feel like uh, sometimes when we, we sat at our desks in the middle of uh, in these Midlands, uh, it doesn't feel like we're having a great impact. And then we hear from these projects and it's hard not to feel totally inspired. And then think, oh, we've, we've played a part in that. It's pretty uh, mind blowing. And uh, well, it's, it's very emotional actually. There's been lots of tears shed this week uh, in a nice positive way and in recognition that uh, that small start has made a big, big difference to lots of people. It's been great. Yeah, and I, I guess it's also capturing the importance of taking time to celebrate success. I think this, you know, this festival is, you know, what we are all involved in in, in trying to do good for the planet is, is a tough um, task. So keeping it fun, surrounding yourself with like-minded people who are supportive and, and to lean on in the difficult times and to celebrate those moments of success is is so important so um well I, I if there's no further questions um I think we'll move to sort of closing what's been an incredible session with remarkable people um I would also say that um uh, there's a slight gender bias to these presentations but obviously that doesn't reflect what's going on behind the scenes and um you know I think I think um it is just showing the power of people, the power of community, and what every single person, where what are, 
you know wherever they are and whatever they want to do it's you, you know everybody can make a difference and um thanks particularly to helen and rachel at sea changes for that idea of taking something from one place uh, or one sector and applying it to the ocean for that patience and persistence when when so many people said no and for the great work that you're doing and continuing to bring new people on board um on that um obviously you have to keep going um and to do that we have the just giving link so any uh, contributions are hugely welcome and it's been wonderful to hear that you've um it brought in another uh, business partner to support this effort and support this festival through extra ice cream so what a wonderful beach related summertime sunny cornish day uh, relevant <laughs> support it's called just down here i don't know what it's like in the in the um, east midlands um i think it's wonderful to know that you know this has been recorded um i think there's messages and and lessons and experiences and just sheer inspiration from hearing the stories of three incredible groups. Um, I am aware of you all, I've learned lots more today, lots more to take away into my work and um, certainly feel hugely um, enthused and bolstered and, and I describe myself as an ocean optimist and I think that this, this kind of conversation today is exactly why because there's just incredible people all around the world doing amazing things and particularly in my home county so that is wonderful to to hear so thank you very much for a wonderful event thanks for all of those who joined us today and um looking forward to the next 10 years of all being uh sea changers thank you, thank you everyone thanks cheers thank you, thank you. bye bye